Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. We are just a few days out from the much anticipated total solar eclipse across parts of the United States from Texas to Maine and everywhere in between. Lots of folks going to be flocking to the path of totality uh, come Monday afternoon. Uh, but of course, it has to be clear where you are in order, in order to experience the eclipse in its full splendor. So in this video, we're going to look at the forecast for the totality path take a look at who is expected, who at least at this point is expected to have a little bit better shot of having clear skies, and who may be socked in with clouds at this point. So we're going to take a look at that. I've held off on doing this kind of a forecast until now because forecasting something as finicky as cloud cover is very, very difficult, pretty much near impossible, more than a few days out from the event. But models are starting to converge on a, a single solution uh, for this event, uh, for Monday. Uh, and so I thought it would be a good time to do our first eclipse forecast. But before we get to the eclipse, we have some severe weather to deal with. The SBC has outlined a slight risk, level 2 out of 5, for parts of Nebraska into Kansas for tomorrow. Saturday, April 6th, big old marginal risk up to the Kansas or the Nebraska South Dakota border down into Oklahoma. This is going to be a low end threat, but we do have an all hazards risk on the table. Tornado threat at 2% there for Nebraska into Kansas, along with a damaging wind and large hail threat. This is expected to again remain a fairly low end threat. We do have some uh, pretty big flies in the ointment to deal with with this setup. So we're going to look at the overall. Um, forecast for tomorrow first, just take a, a real brief glance at the setup for tomorrow, uh, and then we'll get into the eclipse forecast, but we also have some severe weather to deal with early next week. Three consecutive days of severe weather starting next week. That does include Monday and could hamper uh, eclipse viewing for folks in the 15% region you see here. This is for Monday, April 8th. SBC's outlined a 15% slight risk there from the Red River region southward into much of central and east Texas. That includes the Dallas-Fort Worth and Waco areas. Dallas is in the totality path there, but it looks like uh, eclipse viewing may be a little bit difficult there. Uh, and we'll talk about that coming in just a little bit. Then we have a severe threat in a very similar area for Tuesday, East Texas into Louisiana. And then on uh, Wednesday, the threat shifts east into the Gulf Coast states, East Texas, Louisiana, Southern Arkansas, Mississippi, Western Alabama. Um, we're going to, so basically the, the outline for this video, I'm going to be to take a look briefly at tomorrow's threat, uh, severe threat. Then we'll go into the eclipse forecast and kind of look at the cloud cover and precipitation across the totality path, along with the severe threat for Monday. And then we'll take a look kind of at, at the severe threat overall from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, to close out this video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. First, let's take a look at what's going on in the atmosphere right now across the country. This is our current 500 millibar map from the SPC Mesoanalysis page. Pretty interesting pattern across the country at this point. A uh, couple of big troughs you see. The first one is that old system that uh, produced our significant severe weather outbreak on uh, April 1st and 2nd. This has since started to move out, uh, and behind it, we're replacing it with this big old trough here across the western half of the country. This is our next trough that is expected to take shape into tomorrow and provide our severe weather threat across Nebraska and Kansas uh, tomorrow afternoon. This is going to continue to eject down to the south, take on a very nice negative tilt as we go into tomorrow, and provide plenty of forcing for severe storms across this region uh, tomorrow afternoon. As you might expect, we have seen, uh, since we've started to see this southwesterly and southerly flow traverse the Rockies here, we have started to see low-level cyclogenesis. Here is our current surface map, and we see we do see broad, a very broad surface cyclone here starting to take shape across the plains. Uh, strong pressure gradient winds across the central and northern plains today as that low starts to tighten, and we'll see additional tightening and consolidation of that surface low here somewhere in the eastern Colorado vicinity, probably going into the evening hours tonight into tomorrow, and that surface level will play a role as well in our severe threat tomorrow across Nebraska and Kansas. Um, but the problem here, this system, this lead system that ca caused our severe weather outbreak on April 1st and 2nd, that has been a big fly in the ointment with this setup. And that the reason is, is because this surface low and the cold front associated with it have really swept the moisture well into the Gulf and the Atlantic. Uh, and so we are not going to have uh, enough time to get really robust moisture in here for tomorrow's severe threat. Here's our current surface map, uh, and you see what we're dealing with here. 30, 20s and 30s here uh, across southern Kansas and uh, Kansas and Oklahoma at this point. Not even 60s dew points until you get down here toward the Brownsville, Corpus Christi area. So our, our best moisture well, well off to the south. And that's not something you want to see um, a day ahead of time of a severe weather event if you're looking for severe weather. 
uh, at this point, we're just not going to have enough time to really get robust moisture northward into the region. So moisture is definitely going to be a limiting factor tomorrow, uh, especially with northern, northern extent. If we look at our northern portions of the risk area, um, we are still, we're sitting in the, the teens and 20s across Nebraska and Kansas where that slight risk is for tomorrow. Um, that is not going to have enough time to change rapidly. We're going to try our best uh, as that surface flow is really going to tighten up out here across uh, eastern Colorado, western Kansas. We'll have very strong forcing from the trough to allow that surface flow to tighten. So we will see some semblance of these surface winds backing and strengthening quite a bit to try to pull moisture northward. We'll probably see 50s and maybe some 60s up here to the Red River, but 50s across Oklahoma, but not expected to be too much of a threat down there. We'll, we'll be lacking instability and forcing anyway across uh, far southern portions of the developing dry line. But up here, closer to the surface low, closer to the exit region of the negative tilt trough moving in, uh, we're probably going to see anywhere from low to mid, maybe even upper 40s dew points at best across Kansas and Oklahoma, which even though we'll have strong kinematics at play, um, that moisture is really, really on the marginal side for severe weather. So that's going to be a very, uh, the main limiting factor for tomorrow's event is going to be moisture not being able to make its way up into the region. All right, let's take a look at the NAM real quick. This is the uh, 12Z NAM from this morning at 500 millibars. And you see as we go on into the uh, afternoon today and evening hours tomorrow, that trough really starts to take, or evening hours today, that trough really starts to take on a nice negative tilt nature as it swings into the central U.S. by tomorrow morning. Very, very negatively tilted trough, very potent jet streak rounding the base of this trough. And that is going to allow for plenty of forcing for severe weather across, ahead of the dry line here and ahead of the surface low out here across Kansas and Nebraska. You see as we continue into tomorrow afternoon, that is going to really take shape. Uh, plenty of forcing, fast moving trough. That's probably going to allow for uh, quite a bit of convection forming along the dry line and uh, ahead of the surface low. So that's probably going to lead, just right away, just looking at this, plenty of forcing for severe storms. That's probably going to lead to a uh, pretty quick transition to a clustered linear mode here. Uh, and so the overall uh, severe threat is going to remain limited because of the moisture, but overall because of storm mode as well, uh, not looking to be all that favorable. We'll take a look at a little bit more at that here in a second, but very potent kinematics aloft. So the, the shear is not going to be the problem with this setup. It's going to be instability and moisture. We go down to the surface here and we'll back it up. So that broad surface low across the western U.S. is going to tighten up pretty significantly into eastern Colorado, western Kansas tomorrow. Here we are at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Very tight surface low here across the eastern or western half of Kansas. Strong pressure gradient winds. Going to try again to really get that moisture northward, but it's going to take... Uh, we would need a couple more days for this to happen. And if we had 60s dew points all the way up here in Oklahoma already, then we'd be talking about a more robust severe weather event. But because we don't have that, uh, that's just not going to be the case tomorrow. But very tight surface low, very strong surface pattern here. Um, and that is going to be, again, allow for plenty of forcing for severe weather. You did notice here as well uh, that the flow aloft is going to be very much meridional, south to north flow uh, instead of more, uh, more of a westerly component. That also may allow for the, those deep layer shear vectors to be very much meridional, very much more southerly, and therefore that is going to allow for a pretty unfavorable uh, orientation with respect to the initiating boundaries for discrete uh, supercells. Taking a look at the moisture here, let's go down to our southern plain sector. So you see very limited moisture here across the southern portion of the U.S. at this point. Uh, by zero Z, we start to, the NAM is showing 60s dew points in here. I tend to think that's a little bit suspect, uh, but we do start to get moisture up to the north. Mid 50s dew points to the Red River by 10 a.m., 15 Z. And those continue to stream their way northward into the Kansas vicinity, southern Kansas, by 21 Z, 4 p.m. We see, we see mid 50s dew points down here just north of the Kansas Oklahoma border. But up here, where our main forcing for ascent is going to be, ahead of the trough, ahead of the surface low, you can, you can see very limited moisture up here, uh, mid to maybe upper 40s dew points at best. Um, and But we will have a little bit of colder air aloft, I would suspect, moving its way in ahead of the trough. So in somewhat of a cold core-esque fashion here, we'll have cold air aloft overspreading the region, helping to compensate at least somewhat for the lack of low-level moisture to allow for inst enough instability to warrant a severe threat across these regions. Uh, let's take a sounding here ahead. Again, here's the, our surface low. So ahead of the surface low, we'll say southern Nebraska here take a sounding there. We'll take one here in northern Kansas as well. 
and see what's going to be the expected profiles here. So this is going to be in southern Nebraska ahead of the surface low. And this is a pretty good looking profile for severe storms. Again, 61 over 48 at the surface, so uh, but plenty of cold air aloft. 500 millibar temperatures here. Uh, colder than minus 20 degrees Celsius. So very cold air loft overspreading the region. That is going to help offset the very limited low level moisture here and allow for some instability to build. Uh, six to 700 joules per kilogram mixed layer cape. Uh, and kinematics, again, not going to be too much of an issue. We have plenty of deep layer shear for supercells, plenty of low level shear to support a tornado and damaging wind threat given what should be a very strong low level jet here. You see 850 millibar winds out of the south southeast at 50 knots or so. So very strong low level flow, plenty of turning there for a severe threat. But again, I do suspect that we will see a pretty quick transition to a line given very, very strong forcing and shear vectors parallel to the initiating boundary. Here we are in Kansas, a little bit of convective contamination, but it should give us a decent uh, look here. A little bit higher temperature dew point spreads down here in Kansas, a little bit uh, more clearing it looks like. Again, this is the NAM, so we know the NAM has a cool bias, so the temperatures could be a little bit warmer than this up there in Nebraska. Uh, but down here in Kansas, pretty well mixed low levels there, uh, which would negate the tornado threat a little bit. But, uh, but enough instability to support a severe threat with uh, some of that low, uh, low end uh, hail, tornado, and damaging wind risks there. Let's take a look quickly at our initiating boundary and our shear vectors here. So our, our dry line right in here, and maybe along this portion of the dry line up there to the northeast, on the northeast side of the surface low, your shear vector is a little bit more parallel or perpendicular to the initiating boundary down here in Kansas, much more, uh, much more of a parallelness in those shear vectors uh, with respect to the initiating boundary. So we could see a little bit of a window for discrete, but I think that is gonna be compensated by the very strong forcing uh, given these strong, strong kinematics aloft uh, in the exit region of this incoming trough. Couple of convection allowing models here. Uh, this is the 12Z HRRR just to give us a kind of an idea of what things might look like going into tomorrow. Uh, so this is again, take this with a grain of salt. We don't like using the cams too in depth uh, more, than a, more than a few hours out from the event. But this will give us at least an idea of what we might see going into tomorrow. So you see storms here going into, into the early to mid afternoon hours. This is at uh, 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time. We start to see storms fire ahead of that surface low there from uh, uh, southern and central Nebraska down into northern Kansas. And you can see a very quick transition to more of a linear structure there uh, given all that forcing. So we do see some cellular elements down here to the south. Uh, I suspect we might see a little bit more of a flip-flop, maybe a few more discrete elements up in here, a little bit more of a linear mode down to the south. But overall, we just have such strong forcing here that I think we will see more of a linear uh, organization to the storms as we go into the afternoon tomorrow. Additional storms down here in Oklahoma as well, marginal severe threat given very limited instability with southern extent. Uh, but overall, we should see a, a complex of storms, a, a strongly forced uh, thin squall line here moving across uh, south, southern Nebraska into eastern Kansas uh, by late afternoon uh, tomorrow. Look at one or one or two more cams here just to give some consistency um, here. So this is the WERF ARW model. And we will go forward into tomorrow afternoon once this loads. And you will see probably much of the same. Storms start to fire here by uh, about 2 to 3 p.m. or so across southern Nebraska, northern Kansas, and a quick tr transition to kind of a pencil-thin squall line. Uh, so mostly, I think, a damaging wind threat here. Uh, maybe a spin-up tornado or two, but overall, the, the overall severe threat is expected to remain pretty low uh, tomorrow across these regions, uh, given the strong, uh, strongly linear um, forcing uh, and uh, the overall limited instability. All right, let's get into the forecast for the eclipse on Monday. So here is the path of totality through the United States. It is expected to begin just before 1.30 p.m. here in southwest Texas, 1.30 p.m. 1 p.m. central time, and end just after 3.30 p.m. eastern time there up in Maine. So uh, lots of the U.S. expected to be in this path, uh, anywhere from places like Dallas, Fort Worth, Little Rock, uh, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Buffalo, Rochester, uh, under the gun, for the totality path uh, to, uh, on Monday. So lots of folks going to be able to see this, but of course, again, you have to be have clear skies to really experience the eclipse in full. So first, just a primer on how to forecast clouds. So generally, as we know, clouds are fueled by moisture. When you have very good moisture at a certain level of the atmosphere, you are likely to see clouds. And generally, we're looking for temperature dew point spreads or dew point depressions of less than five degrees Celsius aloft. So 
Here's an example of a Saudi where we have a thick layer of clouds. You can see the red profile, which is our temperature profile, as the weather balloon goes up in the atmosphere. And our green profile, which is the dew point profile as the uh, weather balloon goes up in the atmosphere. When those are really close together, generally less than 5 degrees Celsius apart, and you can see in this particular sounding, that is pretty much the case all the way up through the atmosphere. They're very close together there. That is going to indicate a layer where clouds are likely. Now, this is actually at Caribou, Maine from this morning sounding. If we were to go to our satellite, visible satellite imagery from this morning, you'll see that our area there up near Caribou socked in clouds. And I'll zoom in here to show you that we have a very thick layer of clouds up there as well. So you can see here, you can see a mix of very stubborn low clouds there and some upper clouds from this uh, upper low, that, that is, this low that is spitting off the uh, coast of Maine there. So that is why, that is a pretty great example of why we're seeing pretty thick clouds over that area. Pretty saturated environment here, those dew point depressions less than 5 degrees Celsius or so, going up pretty much through all the way up to about 300 millibars or so. So here's another example from this morning for to back out here to our... Um, continental sector. Let's take a look here over the Midwest. So the Midwest seeing some clouds this morning. So let's take a look at Lincoln, Illinois. And you can see here as well that we have pretty uh, a pretty uh, limited temperature dew point spread or dew point depression there between 700 and 850 millibars. So we were expecting to see some clouds in that layer. And as we zoom in here, of course, uh, that was the case this morning across central Illinois. We've had some nice clouds there, uh, pretty stubborn clouds uh, throughout the morning uh, this morning. We can also determine the type of cloud that we're expecting to see. Up here in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, that's where you're going to see your cirrus clouds, those wispy high-level clouds. Up to here, the upper levels of the atmosphere can't hold as much moisture up there. And, and as we know, much colder air aloft in those levels. Uh, so you have ice crystals that form, and that is what makes up cirrus, those nice ice crystals aloft, which gives you that very much wispier appearance. So cirrus clouds, probably not quite as detrimental to eclipse viewing, viewing because they're so wispy. Um, but we're looking mainly down here in the mid, lower and mid levels of the atmosphere. Uh, and that is where your, your stratus clouds, those, those thick gray decks of clouds, and your cumulus clouds, which are where we have these uh, low temperature dew point spreads, but we have a little bit of instability. So our, if our parcel trace looks something like this in this layer, you'd probably expect to see cumulus clouds in this layer because we have a little bit of instability with these with very high relative humidity uh, and high moisture content in that layer. So that would be a, a nice uh, indication that you were expecting to see cumulus clouds, which as we know, uh, are the, those with more vertical extent. And, and the cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds are, are, are convective in nature. Uh, but those, of course, are pretty thick, as are the stratus clouds. So those are what we don't want to see uh, in these uh, the soundings that we're going to pull from along the path. So that is a just a quick primer on how we're looking for, cloud, for clouds. Basically, we're just looking for moisture at certain layers of the atmosphere as you go up. And those temperature dew point spreads, again, need to be pretty much below 5 degrees Celsius or so uh, to warrant clouds. And we can look at our soundings uh, and, and relative humidity of those layers aloft to get a good idea of where clouds are expected to be. So first, let's look at some of the uh, probabilities for cloud cover on some of the ensemble models. And this is a cool thing that Pivotal Weather has done. They have, if you go up to the top here, they have an actual Eclipse tab that you can click on and gives you this page that you see here. You can choose a computer model, uh, ensemble output. You can look for cloud cover or probability of precipitation, and then you can zoom in on our regions, or your, the particular regions within the path of this eclipse. And so we're, we'll look at the, some of the ensembles here. And this is going to be a total percentage of cloud cover. And it's going to be the mean of the last two runs of each of these ensembles. So they've taken the last two runs, two consecutive runs, and averaged the cloud cover total percentage over these areas. Uh, and that is what you're going to see on the maps here. So this is first the Canadian output. And another cool thing they've done is they've actually put the eclipse path here in red with the center line as that dashed red line on these maps. So you can see exactly where that totality path is. So props to Pivotal for doing this. This is a pretty cool thing that they've done here for folks to look at model data uh, relative to the eclipse path. So this is first the Canadian ensemble models. And the blue colors, this is important, the blue colors indicate higher percentages, higher cloud cover total percentages, and the white and gray colors are less uh, percentages of total cloud cover. 
Uh, I know every model site seems to be different in the color scheme they use, uh, but on these particular maps here on Pivotal, the blue colors are higher cloud cover percentages, and the grays and whites are lower cloud cover percentages, with whites pretty much being no clouds at all. So this, these, we can, they, we can have, we have a little slider here that we can go back through the last several runs. So this is the Canadian Ensemble from yesterday evening. Uh, so the last couple of runs averaged out cl total cloud cover percentages. You can see here, and uh, again, the eclipse is expected to start about 18Z um, uh, here, just after, uh, just before 1:30 p.m. in Southwest Texas. So 1 p.m. is going to be 18Z. So 18 to 3:30 p.m. Eastern. So um, you know, eight, that 18, 19, 20Z time frame is what we're going to be focusing on here for the eclipse. So this is Monday at 18Z. And you can see first off the blue colors, the grays and blues down here in Texas. So the, the Canadian model here, at least on the most recent runs, has shown quite a bit of cloud cover, cover over the southwestern portions of the path within the US. Uh, and we also see, we do see some pretty clear skies in the middle there, Arkansas and Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, before we see a little bit extra cloud cover up here across the uh, eastern Great Lakes into New York, Pennsylvania, and then up here in the northeast, fairly clear as well up there into parts of Maine. We go back in the last several runs, and that has been pretty consistent here. And you can see how that has not changed all that much on the Canadian Ensemble over the last several days here. It's expect we've pretty much locked in on that solution from the Canadian of cloud cover down here in Texas fairly clear in the middle uh, and some clouds up here in the northeast before up in the far northeast portion of the U.S. up in Maine there, uh, right around that Maine region, pretty clear. Now we can look at the American Ensemble. So this is the GFS Ensemble, and this has been one of the models that has been really uh, detrimental to Eclipse viewers across the path. Here's the most recent couple of runs here from this morning's run as the latest run, and you can see all across the path, lots of cloud cover progged by the GFS Ensembles along the path. 100% uh, cloud coverage there in South Central Texas. Uh, very, uh, only this little uh, peak here uh, in uh, Illinois and Indiana where we might see a little bit better uh, chance for clear skies uh, and then up to the north. So on the GFS ensembles and the Canadian ensembles, the northeast looks to be, at least right now, your best bet. Uh, it has the most agreement so far on clear skies up there. So New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine looks to be your best bet with lots of cloud cover here along the path on the GFS ensembles. And that has been pretty consistent here over the last several runs as well. So we go back in time and you see that has not changed a whole lot at all. Lots of cloud cover here being progged by the GFS ensembles. Now the European ensembles uh, do not have cloud coverage maps, but, but they do have probability of precipitation maps. So this is going to be, uh, again, the mean of the last two runs of the 12-hour QPF. So the 12-hour total uh, precipitation, uh, the probability of that 12-hour precipitation uh, in the 12 hours preceding Monday at 7 p.m. Central, uh, a probability of that being greater than five hundredths of an inch. So measurable precipitation, really. And as we know, of course, precipitation is connected to cloud cover. So where we have areas of precipitation in the preceding 12 hours, we may have quite a bit of cloud cover to deal with. And the European model certainly showing something similar to what the Canadian model was showing, that we have quite a bit of a chance of heavier precipitation down here across parts of Texas, not so much in the middle there. So northern Arkansas, um, southeast Missouri, southern Illinois and Indiana, up into Ohio, kind of a, a clear spot there, and then a little bit up here across the eastern Great Lakes. Uh, into uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and then up in the Northeast, once again, very, very clear. So some trends starting to emerge from these models. We'll look at the NWS blend of models. This is some you know, the in-house National Weather Service models back to our cloud cover maps. And so this is a pretty similar look to some of the other models. Lots of cloud cover down here from the Arklatex southwestward down into Texas. So uh, Texas looking pretty unfavorable at this point for the eclipse in the middle here. Uh, a little bit of that clearing south in northern Arkansas, southeast Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and then some precipitation or some cloud cover up here uh, in those same spots as the other models were showing. Pretty clear up here in the uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine corridor. So some trends that we're all already starting to see from these different ensemble models. Looks like parts of the Arklatex down into Texas going to be fairly unfavorable for eclipse viewing. Just looking at, the, at these cloud cover maps, we're going to dig into the meteorology here in just a little bit. Um, in the middle here, potential for a little bit uh, of a better chance for clearer skies. Uh, northern Arkansas, northeastward into Indiana and western Ohio. 
And then we see a little bit of an additional batch of cloud cover there um, from eastern Ohio into Pennsylvania, uh, New York, western New York. Uh, and then up here in the northeast, perhaps as far west as uh, northeast New York into uh, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Maine, that is probably likely to be your best bet for clear skies up here in the far northeastern reaches of the country. And that totality path goes right through north central Maine. So that may be your favorite spot for a really, really good chance of clear skies up there. Everywhere else looks a little bit dicey. There is some uh, uh, some um, evidence of all of these regions here on at least some form of the models that we may see some cloud cover here with the Arklatex corridor down into Texas being probably your, your worst bet uh, as far as eclipse viewing just by looking at these maps as well as here into uh, eastern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, western New York. Another model we can use is the NAM. We're finally starting to come into NAM range for this particular event on Monday. Uh, and so we'll start at 12Z Monday on the NAM. And you see quite a bit of cloud cover to start the day across much of the path in Texas. And that cloud cover continues to spread to the northeast, going toward about 18Z, which is when the eclipse is about to start. There, pretty much the entire path across um, Texas into Arkansas. Uh, socked in clouds. You have a, a nice stretch there from in southeast Missouri, southern Illinois that looks cloud free. And then up in Indiana, Ohio uh, looks to be pretty clear. And then of course, as that the same trend here with the northeast looking pretty clear at that point. Clouds continue to spread northeastward. Uh, and then by 21Z, uh, pretty much the same. So pretty much uh, many of the same trends that the other models were showing, uh, but just wanted to give another possible uh, outcome uh, by using the NAM here. So let's take a look at some of the meteorology uh, behind these forecasts. So we'll start off with the GFS here. And I'm not going to use the GFS ensembles uh, because the operational GFS is looking pretty close to what the ensembles are showing, and we can actually pick soundings here from the operational GFS. So here we'll start at 500 millibars, and here's our big old first trough, uh, our main threat, uh, main synoptic forcing mechanism for tomorrow setup, and this is again the 12Z GFS, so hot off the press, uh, to, uh, this morning's model data. And then behind this trough is when we start to see our next trough take shape and become kind of a cutoff low here over the desert southwest. That is going to kind of hang out here for a few days, and ahead of this we're going to have broad southwesterly flow across much of Texas into Oklahoma and Arkansas. So we'll have strong flow aloft, strong deep layer shear for a severe weather threat, and we will we will have plenty of moisture returning up into the northern uh, up into the U.S. And if we look at our dew points here, dew point and surface map, we'll probably see some surface low development out here across West Texas, Western Mexico, uh, and that should allow for that so that richer low level moisture that we're not going to see with tomorrow's setup to really start making its way inland for this uh, this time frame on Monday. So as this loads here, we'll go forward. You see that uh, surface low with the uh, incoming trough for tomorrow kind of meandering its way off into the Midwest. And then we see richer moisture start to get pulled into the region up toward the Arklatex Red River vicinity by uh, early afternoon on Monday. 60s and 70s dew points here uh, from Tennessee down to the southwest, parts of Oklahoma into Texas and Louisiana. So that incoming moisture uh, surge is likely to have some cloud cover associated with it. So that's probably why a lot of the models are showing pretty unfavorable conditions here for eclipse viewing from Arkansas southwestward into Texas that because of this pretty uh, rapid surge of moisture. Let's take a look at our relative humidities as we go up in the atmosphere at every different level. You don't hear me use relative humidity a lot here on the channel. It's not a great measure to use uh, for a, a, as a far as a moisture variable goes, especially if we're looking at the surface and looking. We, we want to be using more absolute measures of moisture that don't change with temperature. But here, this is a good enough proxy for us to see the different uh, moisture uh, the mo at different levels of the atmosphere. So we'll start out at 850 millibars here. The greens and blues are going to be higher relative humidities, and the browns are going to be much lower relative humidities and therefore drier air. So we want to see, again, that the little bit more dry air to have a, a lesser chance of having cloud cover at here. Uh, so this is, again, 850 millibars. So we'll go forward here on the GFS into Monday, and you see that surge of low-level moisture northward into the region. Here we are at 18Z. Lots of low-level moisture surging northward. Very high relative humidities here, meaning that those dew point depressions here at 850 millibars are probably on the low side. So probably a lot of cloud cover here 
from Texas into the Arklatex region, southeast Oklahoma into Arkansas, up here to the north, much drier air, a little bit of a dry pocket of air here from northern Arkansas into southeast Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. Then a little bit more moisture up here toward Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and then of course much drier air here up toward the northeast across parts of uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. Uh, and that is a pretty much stays in place uh, through about 21Z. So looks like on the GFS model, at least our recent GFS, we're going to be dealing with a lot of low-level clouds. That is uh, due to that very strong low-level moisture return. And we'll pick some soundings here from along the path in just a little bit. But it looks down, looks like down here across the Gulf Coast region, Texas into the Arklatex, southeast Oklahoma into Arkansas, that's where your best chances for cloud cover is going to be because of that very rapid low-level moisture transport and very high relative humidities here at 850 millibars. 700 millibars, let's go up a little bit in the atmosphere. So this is our uh, kind of lower mid-level look at the moisture. So we'll go into Monday. And we see here at 15Z, 18Z, a lot of drier air aloft here, uh, especially from uh, northeast Texas in through that path uh, into the Midwest. So it looks like here we're going to be dealing with a lot of low clouds. That Those 850 millibar and that, that lower level moisture is really going to be where those clouds are going to be situated. And those will probably tend to be a little bit thicker uh, in nature. A little bit more stratus, maybe some cumulus, cumul uh, we'll, maybe some cumulus in there. We'll look at the soundings here in just a second again. Uh, but as we go up in the atmosphere, it looks like it dries out a little bit. So it looks like the low levels are where our clouds are going to be hanging out here, especially with southwestern portions of the eclipse path. Up here, we're starting to see, we're continuing to see that moisture as we go up in the atmosphere, up across the uh, northeast Ohio, northwest Pennsylvania, western New York portion of the setup. So there may be some more persistent, uh, more th thicker cloud decks up in there uh, that may be a little bit uh, more difficult to erode. Uh, we'll look here at 500 millibars, continue to go up in the atmosphere to see if that's the case. Those thicker cloud decks, of course, the more clouds you have, the, the harder it is to erode. So we want to see uh, if we have just you know maybe one layer, it might be a little bit easier to erode. Uh, but, but down here in Texas, that persistent moisture return might compensate for that in not a good way for eclipse viewing. So here we are, relative humidity at 500 millibars. So we'll go forward into Monday once again. And once again, we see pretty dry air here uh, across the region. A little bit of those more milky colors into the greens there across Texas. So maybe some semblance of high level cloud cover here. But in this region, we're continuing to see dry air. So that northern Arkansas, southern Missouri, southern Illinois, Indiana corridor, perhaps into western Ohio might be your favorite corridor here for folks in the center portion of the country. Up in here, we continue to see a little bit of that uh, band of moisture into western New York, um, but that 850 to 700 millibar layer certainly socked in with moisture. So cloud cover is likely up here, up across eastern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, western New York. Up here in the northeast, once again, looking pretty primed for eclipse viewing up in that region, uh, especially you know central to south central Maine, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire. Looks to be pretty darn good for eclipse viewing up there. 300 millibars, we'll look, this is where we're going to start to see those seriform clouds, those more cirrus, wispier clouds. Uh, that is where they are going to reside up here in the very far reaches, upper reaches of the atmosphere. And again, cirrus clouds, a little bit more wispy. Uh, so you, even if you have a little bit of cirrus over your viewing location, might not be as detrimental to if, than if you were at a, at a location where you were socked in with stratus clouds uh, and a lot more um, you know, cumulus clouds per se. So here we are Monday. And here we are seeing a lot of high level clouds. This is at 18Z, so a lot of upper level moisture here across a, a pretty solid portion of the path. So this could mean this could mean we are dealing with a little bit of cirrus going up from the Midwest all the way down into that uh, what we thought was a favored corridor here uh, from uh, Missouri into Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana. Could be a little bit of cirrus to deal with. And down here to the southwest, once again, Sierra. So we're going to have a lot of clouds. It's looking like Texas, Arklatex region, Oklahoma, uh, central to southwest Arkansas, going to be socked in clouds at several levels here, especially in the low levels. But we could be dealing with some cirrus here. Once again, up in the northeast, uh, very limited moisture up aloft. So that would be, again, that's going to be looking like your favorite corridor. Uh, for clouds up in that portion of the country. So uh, interesting development here on the GFS that we are seeing a lot of upper level moisture here at 300 millibars, which may be indicative of some cirrus clouds that we're dealing with across the uh, a large portion of the path from Texas into the Midwest. Let's look now at the European model. So we'll look at the European model's uh, moisture here. So let's do kind of the same 
uh, sort of look here. We'll go into the upper level moisture fields. So this is the 0z euro from last night. We don't have the new European model in yet. So this is 850 millibars, once again, our low level moisture. Going into Monday, and so this would be a little bit more favorable here. The euro showing perhaps a little bit slower advance of low level moisture down here uh, in the Gulf Coast region. Still parts of southwest and southern Texas socked in there with low level moisture, but up here, the Arctotex, Southeast Oklahoma, Arkansas, that may be a little bit more favorable uh, for less low level cloud cover. And then up into the Midwest as well, we're seeing some pretty dry air. Uh, then that patch there in the uh, Eastern Great Lakes and then Northeast once again, pretty clear. 700 millibars. So we're just gonna go up in the atmosphere, take a look at these uh, different layers. So here we are, 18Z Monday, pretty dry air here at 700 millibars. So that is a pretty good sign on the European model in particular. Uh, still some cloud, some, some moisture there at 700 millibars there across the eastern Great Lakes, and then the northeast pretty clear as well. So the European model looking a little bit more favorable for areas down here farther to the south, southeast Oklahoma, the Arctic, Arkansas into Missouri. Um, um, the GFS, as we as we saw, was showing a nice little area there from northern Arkansas into Indiana, Ohio. But here maybe a little bit of hope for parts of the, Texas, including maybe the DFW Metroplex there. Uh, for some lesser cloud cover, 500 millibars. We'll see here, and we do start to see a little bit overspreading the region by 18Z here at 500 millibars, but still off to the north, looking pretty clear. Uh, same, pretty much the same trends as what we were seeing. And then let's look for our upper level clouds, that more those more seriform clouds here at 300 millibars. So here we are, Monday. And we kind of see the same thing. Lots of upper level moisture overspreading the region. Not uncommon ahead of these troughs to have some cirrus, a uh, little bit of a cirrus plume overspread the region. So we are seeing some upper level moisture, which could mean a tendency for cirrus clouds to form. Again, that's not super detrimental, unless it's a really thick deck of cirrus, but uh, cirrus is not gonna be super detrimental to viewers here. Uh, if we get a lot of cirrus, as they're more wispy and you can see through those cirrus clouds pretty well. Um, but a lot of the path here socked in with, with some upper level moisture uh, and potential seriform clouds uh, over a lot of uh, a decent portion of the path. All right, let's take some soundings from along the path to see how the construction of clouds is going to is, is expected to be made up. So we'll start down here. This is our cloud cover map again once because the uh, pivotal has, has added the track line, the totality path to these maps. So we're going to look at this and just take some soundings from along the path. So we'll start here in kind of uh, central Texas. And, and we'll see why we're dealing with a little bit of cloud cover. We can see that upper level moisture working its way in. So, so perhaps some cirrus that we're gonna be dealing with as well as some lower level clouds. You see some of that, we talk about in severe weather setups a lot, that deep moisture uh, is, is good for severe weather. Well, that can also cause quite a bit of cloud cover. Eventually that does tend to erode during the day, but at this point in the day, we might be socked in clouds a little bit here, especially low level cloud cover with very saturated uh, low levels below about 850 millibars or so. So central Texas, that is a reason why we might be socked in clouds there. Let's take a look here. We'll take one in Southeast Oklahoma, right near the Broken Bow area. A beautiful area for viewing the eclipse if we were to get clear skies. And once again, that upper level cloud cover starting to show its its ugly head there. Again, cirrus not too bad, but uh, we do have quite a bit of it, quite a deep layer of saturated profiles here from up above about 350 millibars or so up to about 200 millibars. So we could have a, a fairly deep layer of cirrus to deal with, which may be a little bit on the thicker side and not quite as favorable if we just had a little bit of wispy cirrus that we were dealing with. Low levels also pretty saturated, so some low level cloud cover is possible there. And again, this is just one model. I am unable to click on European model soundings here, uh, but this should give us at least a decent idea. So let's take one up here into southeast Missouri. And again, remember the GFS is a lot more uh, gung-ho with the cloud cover um, than some of the other models. Up here in Missouri, not a lot of low-level cloud cover to deal with at all. Very dry, low to mid-levels. But up here in the upper levels, again, perhaps a thick deck of cirrus. That's, you know, several kilometers. That's about... Uh, you know, eight kilometers to 12 kilometers. So about four kilometers uh, uh, thick of this saturation here in the upper levels of the atmosphere could lead to a pretty thick cirrus deck that may hamper things uh, altogether. Now let's go up here toward uh, kind of Southwest Indiana. A little bit better up here, but a little bit of a shallower layer, but still some, some upper level moisture to deal with there. And then let's go up here into uh, the Northeast. We'll take one here um, into far Western Maine, how about? 
And this is a pretty pristine looking profile for a lack of cloud cover. You don't see anywhere except here at the surface, but still our temperature dew point uh, spread there uh, over that five degree threshold. So we don't see anywhere really in the entirety of the column where those t dew point depressions are less than five degrees Celsius. Those, those profiles are not close together at all. So that would indicate a very good chance for clear skies up there in the far northeastern reach of the country. Now we do have one more higher resolution model that we can look at, and that is the RDPS. This is kind of the Canadian equivalent of our NAM model. So this is a little bit higher resolution, and I've heard some good things about the RDPS uh, as far as cloud cover uh, modeling goes. This may be one of your better models for modeling clouds uh, across the US and Canada. So this is the uh, new model run, 12Z uh, this morning. So the model run that, is, that has come in within the last several hours. And this is what it's showing Monday at 18Z, so 1 o'clock Central Time Monday. And this is a pretty optimistic view, uh, and this would definitely be the best case scenario for portions of the path. You see our, center line, our totality path here in red, and a lot less cloud cover here for much of the path from Texas to the northeast into the Midwest. Still dealing with these stubborn clouds here across eastern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, western New York. So that is, uh, at least on all the models, looks to be one, one area that may be uh, unfortunately socked in clouds for this event. But... This is definitely an improvement from some of the other models that we were looking at here across the uh, northeast Texas into Arkansas portion of the path. Up in the northeast, still looking very, very clear. So again, that still looks to be your best bet and most uh, higher, pro highest probability bet for clear skies up there in the northeast. But this would definitely be a best case scenario for folks in the central U.S. Uh, could just make a trip down here to the northeast Texas area, Arkansas into Missouri. Let's take some soundings here from across the path and see why this is the case. So we'll take one here in Texas where a lot of our other models had quite a bit of cloud cover and we can see why the RDPS is backing off a little bit on cloud cover in this region. Still a little bit of saturation up here in the upper levels of the atmosphere, but it's a much uh, thinner layer and not quite as saturated as what the other models were showing. So that would mean a little bit more uh, broken cirrus perhaps. And then down here in the low levels, a lot drier low level atmosphere, a little bit of uh, the moisture there at, at 850 millibars, but not too much, not super saturated at all. That would be about you know minus nine, uh, and that would be about, uh, or, or nine, and that would be about 16. So that is not really meeting that, that five degrees Celsius threshold for dew point depressions there. So this would be fairly free of clouds, maybe some high level cirrus uh, to deal with, but overall not a ton of cloud cover here in this particular model, which is a very good sign for folks here in this region. Up here in the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, we'll take one up there in Indiana, and that is Pretty favorable. Maybe some upper level cirrus, some patchy cirrus up there, but for the lower levels, uh, that is looking very, very favorable for a lack of low level and mid level cloud cover, uh, except for maybe some upper level cirrus there. It looks like a pretty good look here on the RDPS. Up here in the western New York vicinity, we'll see that we'll see why little, quite a bit of moisture there from 850 to 700 millibars, which would keep those that, those mid level clouds kind of in place throughout much of the day, and then the northeast. Uh, probably will continue to look really, really good. No clouds at all in this particular profile. So again, that is West Central Maine. Uh, that is your best bet for uh, clear skies. So all in all, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. Again, this may change over the next couple of days and we see, we're see we still seeing a little bit of difference in the overall models. But uh, for now, right now, it looks like we may be dealing with quite a bit of cirrus clouds uh, over a large swath of the country from Texas all the way into the Midwest. Uh, with a lot of low-level cloud cover here in the Arklatex region down to the southwest. So definitely losing hope here for the Texas to Arklatex portion, southeast Oklahoma, central to southwest Arkansas portion of the totality path. Definitely going to be hoping for the RDPS solution of less cloud cover in these regions. Up here to the, in the middle, pro probably some cirrus to deal with, although that cirrus deck may be a little bit on the thicker side. Still, it is cirrus, so a little bit wispier and easier to see through, but... Uh, that is a, a fairly thick layer of saturation saturation up in the upper levels of the atmosphere there. Your best bet right now is looking to be in the northeast. So northeast New York, uh, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont into Maine looks like our best bet uh, for very clear skies up there given uh, a very dry profile all the way through the atmosphere. Again, things are going to change and I'll hopefully be, ba be back with another cloud forecast here as we get closer to the eclipse on Monday. But for now, this is what we're looking at. Uh, and uh, so a lot of the a lot of the portion of the path in the U.S. going to be struggling with some cloud cover with the best bet up here of of clear skies up in the far northeastern reaches of the country. 
To close things out for this video, let's talk briefly about the severe weather threat uh, to start next week, Monday through Wednesday. Again, multiple severe threats down here in the East Texas to Louisiana corridor, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, so as we talked about, this is we're going to start Sunday evening here on the 500 millibar map from the GFS. As we talked about, we have this trough digging down into the southwest U.S., and that's going to kind of cut off. It's going to become a closed cutoff low here going into Monday. We'll have this broad belt of strong southwesterly flow out ahead of it, some ripples uh, rotating through that flow which may provide enough impetus for severe storm development out here along with these surface features here across the Arklatex region into North Texas uh, on Monday. So that trough is going to sit out there across the desert southwest for a couple of days and then finally start to eject on Tuesday. We'll have a little bit stronger flow making its way into the Texas region on Tuesday uh, as the trough moves its way in. The trough will take on a negative tilt, uh, more, more of a neutral tilt, I'd say, as we go as it moves into the, the southeast on Wednesday. And we see some strengthening of the flow in the exit region of this trough on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. That could provide some stronger deep layer shear and perhaps a stronger low-level response out here across the southeast for a potentially robust event on Wednesday. So go, going back a little bit to Monday, let's take a look at the uh, how the low-level pattern progresses. Uh, so we'll go into Monday. We taught, we saw some of that moisture return associated with as this initial low from our Saturday system moves off to the northeast. We'll start to get additional surface load development out here as the southern trough kind of makes its way into the southwest U.S. and that broad southwesterly flow traverses the higher terrain here of eastern New Mexico into west Texas. We'll start to see at least weak surface load development out here and we'll try to get that those 60s dew points, that richer moisture up into the Arklatex region by early Monday afternoon. There's a weak, broad surface flow out here, dry line back here to the west, and you know we'll call this kind of a warm frontal boundary up here into eastern Oklahoma and Arkansas, with plenty of warm sector down here to the south to support a severe threat. Let's let's zoom in here on our southern sector to get a look, and so we'll go back here to Monday afternoon. This is going to be 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time Monday. Plenty of moisture here to support a severe threat. Strong deep layer shear, not a not a huge focus, uh, focusing mechanism for severe weather. Just that broad, weak surface low out here across uh, eastern New Mexico, west Texas. Not really a really tight dry line, uh, and kind of your warm front uh, located off well to the north, but plenty of warm sector once again. So we'll take a sounding out here in the warm sector. And given that we don't have a super strong low-level response, not much in the way of low-level shear. We see a fairly unidirectional profile here in the lowest levels of the atmosphere, leading to very limited low-level shear. And so mostly just a long hodograph, uh, 50 knots of effective bulk shear, so plenty of shear for organized severe weather and supercells. Plenty of instability as well, uh, with 1,200 joules per kilogram mixed layer cape, 73 over 67 there at the surface, uh, with fairly deep low-level moisture. So that would certainly support a severe threat. Initially, more discrete supercells could fire out here to the west along kind of this dry line. Uh, and then some out in the open warm sector as we'll have that warm invection regime ongoing. So overall, not quite a, a great focus for, for severe storms, um, but plenty of instability and shear for severe storms. So mostly going to be a large hail threat here with this activity. Uh, and I would suspect we might see quite a bit of convection develop uh, given strong warm convection. And, and, uh, but still, we have kind of weak forcing aloft once again, which is broad southwesterly flow out here. So that could lead to a more... Um, more discrete storm mode, but um, given that we have weak low-level shear, not uh, not a very strong focus for severe storms, it might be kind of splotchy, kind of a lot of convection out here in the open warm sector, uh, and that might allow for a little bit more of a messy mode. And I think with more discrete updrafts, large hail certainly going to be the main risk uh, and damaging winds uh, as well. Tornado threat seems to be very, very low for the Monday portion of the risk. We go into Tuesday, that trough finally starts to eject into the southern U.S., so we'll see a little bit better surface load development out here across north Texas, and then you can see quite a nice moisture tongue making its way up here into southern Oklahoma by early Tuesday afternoon. Tighter dry line here ahead of this, this broad surface low. Um, as dry line slash cold front, you might you might say, but we'll call it a dry line for now. Warm front well up, well off here to the north, uh, and so much more of a focus here on Tuesday. It looks like for severe weather, very nice looking surface pattern as that moisture really feeds into that surface low. So we could see a threat here from the Red River region southward in East Texas and Louisiana. Uh, nice tight dry line there to support severe storms. Uh, we'll look at our deep layer shear vectors here. Let me draw in our dry line. Looks to be right there. That will probably be our initiating boundary. And then we'll look at our deep layer 
shear vectors, bulk shear vectors there. So you see we'll go forward into Tuesday uh, and we should see a nice degree of perpendicularity between the dry line and the shear vector. So that is a pretty good sign for discrete storms on Tuesday. Uh, we will have a, a increasing forcing with time as that trough starts to, to really make its way into the Texas region. Uh, but overall, pretty favorable looking profiles, uh, pro looking setup just at the surface here or at first glance for a severe threat. We do have a, quite an eastward mixing dry line there, so uh, that could allow for a little bit more of a um, messy mode, but decent shear vectors with respect to the initiating boundary uh, will perhaps uh, foster a discrete storm mode uh, initially with this environment. Let's go to 21Z out here. We'll take one just south of the Red River. Still not much in the way of low level shear. Plenty of instability, uh, almost 2000 joules per kilogram mixed layer cape, 75 over 68 at the surface. Plenty of low level instability uh, with a fairly uh, nice looking profile there thermodynamically. Deep layer shear favorable for supercells, but overall limited low level shear once again. So that could be a drawback here with the setup. Still kind of a broad surface low, not a real, real tight surface low, although the, the sur surface boundaries look a little bit uh, more enticing here. Um, but still not a great low level response at this point. This is our 850 millibar flow, low level jet. You can see it just really remains weak out here. Monday evening, um, uh, we could see if storms fire down here farther to the south, a little bit better low level shear to deal with. That's a lot better, but limited instability with southern extent. Then into Tuesday, we just kind of lose that low level jet. Uh, not really, that kind of builds back in well to the east. So. Not looking like much of a tornado threat these, uh, this Monday and Tuesday uh, system. As we go into Wednesday, however, things might start to change a little bit as we'll have that trough start to take on a little bit more of a negative tilt and therefore we'll have a little bit better uh, of a low level response. Let me go down here to the surface real quick and show you our surface response. So here we are going into Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The threat will shift east. So we have kind of a messy warm sector. Surface winds a little bit chaotic, not really strong surface flow out here uh, in the southeast for Wednesday. But we should have strong shear, given that uh, we have maybe a little bit tighter of a surface low, a little bit stronger low-level jet to deal with on Wednesday across this region. That could foster more of a tornado threat here, although the GFS solution a little bit on the wonky side. Probably fairly progressive with the convection, as it usually tends to be. Uh, but still stronger low-level jet across the area uh, for the Wednesday threat, and that would certainly foster a, a tornado threat with this activity. Uh, probably organized in more of a line, given the progressive nature as the trough really starts to swing off to the east. Probably uh, more forcing um, with along the cold front slash dry line and with the trough coming in. So probably more of storm mode issues on Wednesday, but still a much better hodographs here. A large uh, speed and directional shear in the low levels, plenty of curvature there in the low levels of the hodograph, a strong deep layer shear for supercells. So that would foster a tornado threat with those storms, but uh, looks to be probably more of a damaging win and tornado threat on Wednesday. But we're still well uh, out from Wednesday. Uh, still almost, uh, still, you know, five, six days out from that event. So plenty will change in the coming days, and we'll be back with updates as needed uh, as these as the setup approaches. But uh, certainly robust severe weather is possible. Tornado threat looking a little bit minimal here at this point, especially for Monday and Tuesday across Texas and Louisiana. Uh, could pick up a little bit on Wednesday, but storm mode concerns certainly um, are a, an issue there for Wednesday, at least at this point. And we're just, again, looking at one model, not doing our full... Uh, in-depth multi-model look here. We might do that here in a couple days, but uh, just wanted to get uh, mostly focus this video on the eclipse forecast for Monday and talk briefly about the severe threat uh, otherwise. So that is what we have going on for the next several days. Again, for tomorrow, uh, that's the first thing of priority is our severe threat tomorrow across parts of Nebraska and Kansas. Slight risk level two out of five in the yellow shaded region there. So places like Salina, Kansas, Manhattan, Grand Island, Nebraska, under the gun for that greatest severe threat there. Again, very limited moisture should be the uh, main um, a factor in keeping this event at bay from a more precluding a more intense event. Uh, again, pretty strong forcing moving in should foster more of a quick transition to a line up here in southern Nebraska, northern Kansas uh, with that low end all hazards threat, mostly a damaging wind, low end tornado risk. Uh, with maybe some hail risk in, in any more discrete updrafts that develop. Uh, but that is what we have going on for tomorrow. Uh, threat does shift east into Tuesday, uh, into Sunday, but a very uh, low-end threat uh, uh, for that. Parts of the Midwest down into the southeast, very, very low-end threat at this point. 
and then we recharge the atmosphere on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Multiple days of severe risk there, centered on the Texas into Texas region into the southeast. This is Monday. A uh, slight risk outlined for uh, central to east Texas, Red River area southward, Dallas, Fort Worth under the gun, Waco, Austin, Lufkin, Shreveport, Abilene, Wichita Falls under the gun there on Monday. Again, tornado threat does appear low at this time. Could see some large hail and damaging winds. Then we'll go into the day on uh, Tuesday, very much a similar area under the gun, same areas uh, seeing that severe threat on Tuesday. Once again, the threat for tornadoes appears low, large hail and damaging winds appears to be the main threat. Could see a ramp up in the tornado threat as the threat shifts east on Wednesday, east Texas into the southeast, Louisiana, Mississippi, southern Arkansas, uh, but with very progressive features, it looks like the storm mode may be a little bit more of a line, therefore more of a damaging wind and embedded tornado threat, but again, we're still several days out from this event, so lots will change in the coming days, and we'll have updates as needed uh, on the severe threat. Of course, the eclipse looks like uh, cloud cover is going to be an issue for some folks, uh, definitely seeing quite a bit of cloud cover uh, on the models here down into Texas toward the Arklotex region. A little bit of a better chance here from northern Arkansas northeastward into the Midwest uh, before you hit some clouds again there, eastern, western Pennsylvania, western New York, and then the northeast. Looks like your best bet for clear skies out there for the eclipse on Monday. Uh, and if we were to believe our RDPS model, uh, perhaps a little bit of hope down here for southern areas of the, of the uh, eclipse path, but um, still, we're still a few days out from Monday and things may change. Uh, but that is what it's looking like right now for those trying to experience the eclipse uh, in full. So that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.